Well, about the author, her name is Hannah Blank. She's an independent scholar, a historian, a writer, an editor, and a public speaker. Uh, she uh, she has studies in women's in woman and gender studies, human sexuality, and she has also served as a sexual educator. Uh, she's a hardened feminist, something that will definitely be reflected in this particular book, which is called Virgin: The Untouched History. Um, and before she started working on this book, she was starting she was working as a sexual educator in which uh, a lot of teenagers that she was working with would come up to her and ask her about virginity. So this is what drove her to start researching about virginity and how it could physically be tested. Uh, she started asking herself questions such as, does virginity exist? How can it be measured? Has it always been present? Have all cultures regarded virginity in the same way? Virgin, The Untouched History, was actually published in 2007 by Bl Bloomsbury Publisher. And as far as an intended audience, I believe that feminists will really get a kick with this book. Also, just the general population that may have an interest in virginity and how it came to be um, will, ha will definitely enjoy this book. It's a real mythbuster, and it's actually really informative as well. It has a lot of historical facts. Uh, I think Hannah Blank did a really good job in actually doing the research from historical writings to modern writings, and she has put it together all in this book. Well, what I found the most interesting about this book was that it actually made me think of what virginity actually is. Um, I came to realize that the view of virginity that we have in the, in the West actually does not exist. What I actually mean by the West is this connection between hymens and virginity. Um, various ancient writings from Egypt, Greece, the Middle East, and Asia make reference to virgins and virginity, but none of them actually mention the hymen. So it seems like the hymen did actually not exist in our ancient world. For early Greek medicine, the word hymen was widely used, but with a different meaning. They would use this word in reference to the membranes of the organs. So there actually were like hymens of the heart, hymens of the lung, hymens of the brain. Um, any type of membrane was actually called a hymen. And uh, it wasn't actually until the 15th century that the word hymen came to have the meaning that it actually has today, when physician Savonarola described the word as a covering of the cervix. Shortly after, a dictionary published the meaning of the hymen as being in the secret place of the woman, which would actually break when she was the flower. And from then on, we can count on the hymen having the same meaning that we give it today. So hymen this, hymen that, but why does it matter? Well, there is the leading hypothesis in the book which says that um, virginity came to matter um, as a means of parents to start bargaining or to start making business with their daughters. And as it became more popular for men to actually start bringing into their household only virgins, I personally think that it was uh, as a matter of um, a, like an evolutionary type of theory in which where men wanted to, to make sure that the offspring was theirs. Um, so they, so their, their parents actually started taking more care of their, of their uh, daughter's virginity. Some of the most peculiar things that I came upon while reading this book were the tests done to identify virgins from non-virgins. This test included urine tests, in which a person was supposed to be able to tell a virgin from a non-virgin by the sound of her urine. A non-virgin woman would pee faster than a virgin woman because of the non-existence of her hymen. Another test was that of a potion given to drink to a woman. If the woman urinated right after drinking it, she was considered a non-virgin. There was also a test called the fumigation test, in which a woman had to stand up on top of burning aromatic herbs, and if the judging men could smell their aroma through her mouth, she was also considered a non-virgin woman. And the one that I found to be the most ridiculous test done to women back in the day to identify them as virgins or non-virgins was the one using a thread in which they had to measure from the back of her school, on top of their heads, all the way to the point of their nose. And then they would wrap around that thread around their necks. And if it not matched perfectly, she was a non-virgin. If you actually think about this test, I consider that a lot of women were actually killed or rejected by their families because of the outcomes of these tests, which have no scientific proof whatsoever. Um, it actually is quite ridiculous. Um, there's actually uh, some good stories that Hannah Blank uh, tells us uh, concerning virginity. Um, as it was in ancient Greece, when a father, after discovering that her daughter had given it up, he actually fed her to a starving horse. Or in ancient Rome, 
where the Vestal Virgins were actually supposed to keep their virginities for 30 years, and if they did not do this, they would actually be buried alive. Or the story of the Hungarian Countess Bathory, who actually thought that she could preserve her youth and her beauty uh, by bathing in the blood of virgins. She was actually accounted for about 600 deaths of virgins, and yet um, it was supposed to be said that she actually did not like look one year younger than her actual age. So, two iconic uh, virgin figures that are mentioned in the book and that I actually think that they remain present in our modern world was that of the Virgin Mary and that of the Queen Elizabeth I. Um, the Virgin Mary came to be the most important figure in the Middle Ages and her story, of course, uh, her story, of course, is about um, that of being the mother of Jesus, uh, conceiving him from the grace of the Holy Spirit rather than from men. And I think that even today, uh, the Virgin Mary has an impact in the lives of many Catholics, um, especially in the lives of uh, women, um, as far as being uh, chaste, pure, um, not touched. And also, like, Queen Elizabeth I uh, also really grabbed my attention because even having the position of a ruler, um, yet she was still a woman, which in her time was supposed to get married, um, she technically found a way uh, to not get married, uh, to stay a virgin, um, to deceive in Parliament and to making them think that she actually pretended to marry, yet until her death, staying a virgin, well, as far as we know at least. And uh, these two iconic uh, figures also bring a light um, of a different types of virginities when compared to each other. I feel like the Virgin Mary um, was regarded more of like a holy, immaculate type of virgin. And Queen Elizabeth, um, of course, was just more considered uh, as a virgin in the sense that she had not been uh, with a man, she had not had uh, sexual intercourse with a man. So I think that these two figures perhaps embody uh, two different times in history in which the Virgin Mary may represent kind of the version of the past, of, of, of a more pure, innocent, and chaste um, type of virginity, and Queen Elizabeth I embodies the virgin more of the present time, which as far as being like an independent woman who could actually just be in control of her own sexuality, that she could actually decide if she wanted to uh, remain a virgin or if she wanted to marry. Um, so I feel like, like, these two uh, women were actually a very important, um, iconic uh, characters in uh, this book. So this book is technically not based on scientific study, rather um, it's more of a, of a recopilation of many writings from the past, from like the present. And uh, also I think that a lot of it is mixed in the opinion of the author. Um, as mentioned previously, she is a historian, she is a writer, she's an author, uh, and she is also a feminist, which I think that um, it's really reflected in the book and the way that it is written, and in the way in which she portrays virgins, um, even though, I mean, I know that uh, she's taken stories from ancient writings, and uh, but I feel like still throughout the whole book, she writes it from a feminist uh, point of view, which is completely fine. But um, I think that in this point, the book is a little bit biased uh, towards uh, portraying women um, more from like a feminist uh, point of view. And, of course, like, attacking the way in which women have been technically, like, repressed by religion, um, by the supremacy of men over women, of uh, women, like, being the property of men in uh, ancient times, and I mean, still in some parts of the world, it's that it's the reality. Still, um, I do believe that the author uh, does have a lot of uh, education, like, background edu education, this book is not just written by opinion. Um, throughout the book, as you're reading, you can tell that she has done a through research um, of history, really, in virginity, and um, of how it has, how it started, and how it has come to be. Um, still, in the modern world, um, 
by some people even uh, still regarded regarded as something important, um, and for other people, of course, having lost value. Something that this book did make me do was rethink um, my idea of what virginity is, um, uh, as in regards to it being something physical, it being something spiritual. Does it even exist? Why? Um, have I all my life thought of this um, as something important? Am I right? Am I wrong? Um, a lot of the myths that um, were actually thought of in ancient times, which is crazy, um, it's actually uh, laughable, you know? Thinking of something that, um, of some of the tests that they did to women in, in like ancient times to see if they were actually virgins. And uh, it's actually quite sad. Um, I think that a lot of these women were actually punished, were killed, and their families were come to shame, like went, like had some shame um, if for some reason somebody dared to say that they were not virgins. And one of these strange tests failed to, to come in their favor. I feel like the, uh, some of the weaknesses of these book um, from my point of view was that it was not written, written technically kind of like chronologically so to me at some point in the book I actually started getting lost in the reading um, I would uh, my focus would kind of just go away because it was jumping from time to time and I just couldn't really follow at some points however I do feel that the book is written in an easy type of way, like an easy read, technically, like easy vocabulary. It's a fast read. I think that because it is a non-fiction book, it, that all of these stories that are being told um, in this book may have come up as fiction, but technically are representative of the era from which they come from. Uh, makes the book really appealing because technically you're reading about something which at some point was real. Um, the only I think I feel like the major weakness um, uh, for me was just the way that uh, she displayed her strong feminist idea um, on the book, which like I mentioned before, it's completely fine. But it just, um, for me, it, it just was a little bit too biased on that way. Um, yet, uh, it's, a, it's a very good book. I would definitely recommend it.